For several years, I've kept a file entitled simply, The Book. It's filled with a collection of thoughts and ideas, clippings and thousands of pages of disconnected things I've written on one subject or another. I was spoken through it this morning and came across this thought from Plato. Man is declared to be that creature who is constantly in search of himself, a creature who at every moment of his existence must examine and scrutinize the conditions of his existence. He is a being in search of meaning. He's a being in search of meaning. Now, that describes us pretty well, doesn't it? The word search is always used in the description of Homo sapiens, the single surviving species of our branch of living things. Search, journey, the moving from one place to another, growth, a rising up, a moving forward. In the description of what a good education will do for us, one of the items on the list goes, a good education will teach us to love life for its own sake. Now, because as long as we have life as we know it, the search can go on, the search for meaning. Some questions, some problems can be solved. Others are never solved in the sense that they are completed, finished, tied up with a neat bow. And we'll avoid a good deal of frustration, even possible demoralization, if we'll recognize problems for what they are as the kind that can be solved and the kind that, by their very nature, are incapable of being solved. A man named Tyrell calls them divergent and convergent problems. The various parts of a convergent problem can be brought together sooner or later and made to fit and thus form the solution to the problem. A simple example would be represented by the problem of moving some heavy stones. To move them, they can be placed in a strong box. It serves as a container. But the stones are too heavy to lift in the box, so we add wheels to the box, making it into a wagon. The convergent parts were the box and the wheels. Once they are successfully put together, we can move the heavy stones, thereby solving the problem. The solution to convergent problems can be written down so that others faced with similar problems have only to read the instructions. They don't have to do the original thinking all over again. Problems we cannot solve in such a fashion are divergent problems. Their various parts defy successful and final amalgamation. At best, they can only be lived with in as successful a manner as we can achieve, and they still remain ongoing and divergent when we're finally through trying to solve problems of any kind. Life is kept going by divergent problems. They're the problems of opposites, of trying to reconcile the irreconcilable. For example, we want order, but we also want freedom. Too much order, and all freedom is suppressed. Too much freedom, and order dissolves into chaos. E.F. Schumacher, in his book, Small is Beautiful, which I recommend, uses the example of freedom and discipline in education. How can children keep sufficient freedom to properly develop their inherent creativity and still knuckle under to sufficient discipline to learn what must be learned or should be learned? Schumacher says thousands of mothers and teachers successfully reconcile these opposites by bringing a third force, a higher power to bear, the power of love. But even with the power of love and the percentage of it that comes into play during childhood, freedom has a way of giving way to so-called order. Wordsworth tells what happens, as only he could do it, in his Ode on Intimations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood. He wrote, There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth, and every common sight to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. And then those familiar lines, Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy. Coming to grips with growing up in the world we've created tends to take most of the wonder, the joy, and easy laughter out of life. Shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy and upon the growing girl. We've created a world based on science and technology and tend to forget that freedom and creativity represent the hope of the future. Yet... How do you develop the vital ingredients of creativity in any organization and still maintain order, order being the glue that holds the whole thing together? Politics, economics, human relations of all kinds, including marriage, fall into the realm of divergent problems. Nothing is ever solved as the making of the wagon is solved. Instead, these conditions of humankind represent changing, volatile rivers of being flowing endlessly into the future. Our civilization is built on the banks of these rivers, and for the past 10,000 years we've lived with floods and droughts and periods of bountiful prosperity, doing our level best to achieve some kind of reasonable accommodation with these great rivers and the various tribes which live up and down their banks. 
All solutions have been temporary, makeshift. They've been jumping off places, as good books should be, for better attempts in the future. A man and his wife or a woman and her husband do not solve living together successfully. If their marriage can be called successful, it means they are successfully coming to grips with it and have managed thus far to overcome or withstand its problems and tragedies and remain married to each other. Each day they have another day's problems to meet. If they prevail, keep their senses of humor, and continue to like each other, they can congratulate themselves on having successfully come to grips with one of humankind's supreme divergent problems. Everyone who plays golf has, at one time or another, felt that at last he's got the game under control. He's figured it out. He's got the swing he wants, and all is well with the world. Until the next time he plays. Each time he must live with the course and the game anew. Practice and good instruction will improve his game, lower his average score. But golfers know that you don't solve the game of golf. At best, you just keep playing and living with it. Golf is another divergent problem, another coming together of opposites. Finding a successful orientation in the world is a divergent problem. This is not to say there are not those who have found a congenial place along the river bank. Obviously, there are. There are many thousands, perhaps millions, who have found lives as perfectly suited to them as was Picasso's or Shakespeare's or Thomas Edison's or Willie May's. But living itself is a divergent problem and remains so until the end of our days. Ernest Hemingway found his place in the world. He struggled to perfect his art. His stories and novels brought him worldwide fame and riches and earned him the Nobel Prize for Literature. But other problems remained. Writing good novels isn't something you solve either. And he finally took his own life. Perhaps if Hemingway had known that there are problems you don't solve once and for all, that there are divergent problems which by their very nature defy permanent solutions, he could have borne his difficulties. But then I don't know what his difficulties were. They may have had nothing at all to do with his writing, but they were divergent. You can bet on that. If we recognize that human problems can only be lived with on a day-to-day -day basis, perhaps we can keep our sense of humor intact. Perhaps we can keep our creativity and wonder alive. Perhaps we can hold back the shades of the prison house. And perhaps we can keep the lines of despair from etching themselves on our faces. Today, as a species, we face problems of a magnitude unprecedented in human history, and practically all of them are divergent problems. Even the survival of our species, and certainly we're worth saving, along with the brown pelican and the whale, is a divergent problem. Speaking of the problems that face us, James Dyson, the physicist, recently said, If we're wise, we shall preserve intact these qualities of the human species, toughness, courage, unselfishness, foresight, common sense, and good humor, through the centuries to come and they will see us safely through the many crises of destiny that surely await us. He might have added, and we will keep our sense of wonder alive, our creativity, our capacity to think in new directions. The next time you find yourself in an argument with your spouse, you can mention that living together represents a divergent problem. No one has ever solved it yet, and because of the very nature of the problem, no one ever will. Like life itself... It's something you live with and work at, not something you solve. A convergent problem that seems to be solved, or at least nearly so, is the problem of the fuel of the future. We've talked about this before in Direct Line, and it looks as though the fuel of the future has been decided upon. It has all the answers. Do you know what it is? When you look at the parts of the problem, it practically answers itself. The present problem has six parts. One... Oil, gas, and coal are too precious as raw materials for uses that they alone can serve to waste as fuel a day longer than we have to. I had a most interesting discussion on this subject recently in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Burning up the last reserves of our fossil energy would be a crime. Second, we already have more poisonous wastes from nuclear plants than we'll be able to be rid of for thousands of years to come, and we don't want any more. Third, worldwide energy demand is growing at a pace where we must have an energy source unlimited in supply. Fourth, we need a source more powerful than current fuels. Fifth, we want one closer to consumption or easily stored and transported. And finally, we want a source that will ultimately bring costs down for all users. Well, do you know the single energy source that answers all six problems? It's hydrogen. We're heading into the hydrogen age and a total world hydrogen economy, and we'll produce hydrogen with solar energy. 
the general scientific consensus seems to be that solar-produced hydrogen energy from great man-made islands along the coastlines, when technically possible on the desired vast scale necessary for world energy needs, will be the ultimate, possibly the permanent answer to the energy shortages on Earth. It's going to be a slow transition, and petroleum resources will remain as valuable or more valuable than they are today. And there'll be other sources of energy, too. But hydrogen seems to have all the answers, and in unlimited abundance. Being the smallest element, hydrogen is lightweight, diffuses rapidly in the atmosphere. Since it's without polluting effects, it can be burned safely indoors, even in a closed room or a mine. It can be stored in any of its three forms, gas, liquid, and solid, it can be transported. It's flexible, combines well with other elements. It's a powerful energy. Hydrogen took us to the moon and will fuel the space shuttle. Since hydrogen is such a wonder fuel, why hasn't it been adopted before? Simply because fossil fuels have been cheap and plentiful, while hydrogen produced by fossil fuels and nuclear energy up to now has been expensive, thereby limiting it to certain uses in industry and the space program. Now, however, with the growing conviction that it can be produced by using the heat of the sun, the picture changes materially. For in this case, there will be no pollution in connection with its production. Extensive experimentation has shown hydrogen more powerful than gasoline. Present engines can be adapted to its use, and engines built for it save hundreds of pounds in unnecessary parts. Okay, when will solar-produced hydrogen energy be available? Well, estimates vary from the year 1980 to the year 2020. One group predicts a changeover of 51% by 1981, and by 1990, 65%. I saw on the news on television recently where a Frenchman had developed an engine operating on water, the same principle, getting hydrogen and oxygen from water. By using solar heat to decompose water and separate out of it hydrogen and oxygen, also highly important, we can acquire a pollution-free energy. Harnessing the sun's heat should be no more difficult than going to the moon once we've decided that a hydrogen economy is what we want, and soon. The country most likely to develop a workable system, to my mind, is Japan. Not only does Japan have the brains and the technology, Japan must import 98% of its present energy. With great floating platforms ringing the islands of Japan, and with most of her industry close to the seacoast, Japan could produce hydrogen and oxygen from seawater, with the hydrogen stored at depth under the sea. The byproduct, incidentally, is fresh drinking water. In short, Japan could become self-sufficient for all her energy needs, rid herself of her present choking and unhealthy pollution, and have an unlimited supply of oxygen and fresh water to boot. And so could we, and so ultimately could the world. The world reserves of fossil fuels would be as valuable in a hydrogen economy as they are now, but they would be conserved and put to proper use. The supply of hydrogen from seawater is, for all practical purposes, limitless, good for millions of years. The answer lies in the sea, not drilling under it for crude oil, but in releasing the energy stored in seawater, abundant, non-polluting energy. Every country with a seacoast would be self-sufficient, and maybe they could all buy their hydrogen-producing equipment from us. Another happy byproduct of the coming hydrogen age. We've got plenty of sunshine, abundant fresh and salt water, and hydrogen in unlimited supply. For my money, that's where our developmental dollars should be spent. If a man from a previous civilization, an ancient Greek, let us say, or a Roman, suddenly appeared among present-day humanity, his first impressions would probably lead him to regard it as a race of magicians and demigods. But were he a Plato or a Marcus Aurelius and refused to be dazzled by the material wonders created by advanced technology, and were he to examine the human condition more carefully, his first impressions would give place to great dismay. He would soon notice that, though man has acquired an impressive degree of power over nature, his knowledge of and control over his inner being is very limited. He would perceive that this modern magician, capable of descending to the bottom of the sea and projecting himself to the moon, is largely ignorant of what's going on in the depths of his unconscious and is unable to reach up to the luminous superconscious levels and to become aware of his true self. This supposed demigod, controlling great electrical forces with the movement of the finger and flooding the air with sound and pictures for the entertainment of millions, would be seen to be incapable of dealing with his own emotions, impulses, and desires. So writes Dr. Roberto Assagioli in his excellent book, The Act of Will. 
a book I suggest you obtain and read and reread. He goes on to say, As several writers, Toynbee among them, have pointed out, this wide gulf between man's external and inner powers is one of the most important and profound causes of the individual and collective evils which afflict our civilization and gravely menace its future. Man has had to pay dearly for his material achievements. His life has become richer, broader, and more stimulating, but at the same time more complicated and exhausting. Its rapidly increasing tempo, the opportunities it offers for gratifying his desires, and the intricate economic and social machinery in which it has enmeshed him make ever more insistent demands on his mental functions, his energy, his emotions, and his will. For convincing evidence of this, it would suffice to observe the day of the average businessman or politician or career woman or housewife. The individual often lacks the resources to cope with the difficulties and pitfalls of this kind of existence. His resistance may crumble in the face of the demands, the confusions, and the enticements it imposes. The ensuing disturbance leads to increasing discouragement and frustration, even to desperation. The remedy for these evils, the narrowing and eventual closing of the fatal gap between man's external and his inner powers, has been and should be sought in two directions. The simplification of his outer life and the development of of his inner powers. As for the trend toward the simplification of the external life, the trend toward simplicity began even before the rise and expansion of modern technology as a reaction against the increasing complications and artificialities of civilized life. Its greatest exponents have been Jean-Jacques Rousseau with his appeal for a return to nature and our own Thoreau, who renounced the benefits of civilization and withdrew to lead the solitary, simple life which he described so ably in Walden which we recommended in Direct Line 7. Recently, disillusionment with the so-called blessings of technological achievement has exploded into extreme and increasingly bitter indictments of the whole structure of modern civilization, into a wholesale rejection of our present way of life. Up to a certain point, the simplification of life is feasible and desirable. To some extent, everyone is able to resist the attractions of the world and the pace of modern life eliminate many unnecessary complications, re-establish closer contact with nature, and practice the art of relaxing and resting in intervals. But past a certain point, one encounters great difficulties. Duties of every kind, family ties, professional obligations, keep us bound to the wheel of modern life and often compel us to conform to its hurried pace. But even if circumstances permitted a very high degree of simplification, and if it were put into practice, the problem would be only partially solved. Modern man certainly could not, nor indeed has he reason to, abdicate from the predominant position and the consequent responsibility he's acquired on this planet. The evil does not lie in the technological powers themselves, but in the uses to which man puts them, and in the fact that he has allowed them to overwhelm and enslave him. Resistance to the prevailing negative trends of modern life calls for much determination, much firmness and persistence, much clear-sightedness and wisdom. But these are precisely the inner qualities and powers in which modern man is sorely lacking. So we're led to the necessity of recourse to the second procedure, the development of man's inner powers. Only the development of his inner powers can offset the dangers inherent in man's losing control of the tremendous natural forces at his disposal and becoming the victim of his own achievements. A vivid realization that this is indispensable for maintaining the sanity and indeed the very survival of humanity, that only thus can man fulfill his true nature, should spur him on to tackle this task with an intensity of desire and determination equal to that which he has previously devoted to his external attainments. Fundamental among these inner powers, and the one to which priority should be given, is the tremendous, unrealized potency of man's own will. Its training and use constitute the foundation of all endeavors. There are two reasons for this. The first is the will's central position in man's personality and its intimate connection with the core of his being, his very self. The second lies in the will's function in deciding what is to be done, in applying all the necessary means for its realization, and in persisting in the task in the face of all obstacles and difficulties. But when one decides to start this task, one is apt to be confused and baffled. 
A historical survey of the problems relating to the will shows that attempts to solve this problem on theoretical, intellectualistic lines lead not only to no solution, but to contradiction, confusion, and bewilderment. Therefore, I believe, Dr. Seggioli writes, that the right procedure is to postpone all intellectual discussions and theories on the subject and begin by discovering the reality and the nature of the will through its direct existential experience. And that's what this book is about. How to experience the power, the joy, the satisfaction that come from the proper use of the will. It comes about in three phases. The first is the recognition that the will exists. The second concerns the realization of having a will. The third phase of the discovery, which renders it complete and effective, is that of being a will. Now, this is different from having a will. The doctor goes on to point out that this discovery of the will is hard to describe. As is true of any experience, it cannot be fully communicated by words, but the paths leading to it and the conditions favoring it can be indicated. An analogy to the discovery of beauty, to the arousal of the aesthetic sense, may be illuminating. A revelation occurs, an awakening which may come when one looks at the delicate hue of the sky at sunset, at a majestic range of snow-capped mountains, or into the clear eyes of a child. It may come while contemplating the cryptic smile of Leonardo's Gioconda. It may come while listening to the music of Bach, of Beethoven, or while reading the inspired verses of great poets. This awakening sense of the beautiful, though often faint and confused at first, becomes clearer and develops through repeated experiences of an aesthetic nature and can also be cultivated and refined through the study of aesthetics and the history of art. But no amount of intellectual consideration and study can of itself take the place of the initial revelation. The awakening can be facilitated and often brought about by creating favorable circumstances for this purpose. For instance, by the quiet and repeated contemplation of natural scenery and works of art or by opening oneself to the charm of music. Well, the same is true of the will. At a given moment, perhaps during a crisis, one has a vivid and unmistakable inner experience of its reality and nature. When danger threatens to paralyze us, suddenly from the mysterious depths of our being surges an unsuspected strength which enables us to place a firm foot on the edge of the precipice or confront an aggressor calmly and resolutely. Before the threatening attitude of an unfair superior, or when facing an excited mob, when personal reasons would induce us to yield, the will gives us the power to say resolutely, No, at all costs I stand by my convictions. I will perform what I take to be right. Similarly, when assailed by some insinuating and seducing temptation, the will raises us, shaking us out of our acquiescence and freeing us from the snare. The experience of willing may come also in other more quiet and subtle ways, during periods of silence and meditation, in the careful examination of our motives, in moments of thoughtful deliberation and decision. A voice, small but distinct, will sometimes make itself heard, urging us to a specific course of action, a prompting which is different from that of our ordinary motives and impulses. We feel that it comes from the central core of our being. Emerson called it that iron string that vibrates within us or else an inner illumination makes us aware of the reality of the will with an overwhelming conviction that asserts itself irresistibly. However, the simplest and most frequent way in which we discover our will is through determined action and struggle. When we make a physical or mental effort, when we are actively wrestling with some obstacle or coping with opposing forces, we feel a specific power rising up within us, and this inner energy gives us the experience of willing. The discovery of the will in oneself, and even more the realization that the self and the will are intimately connected, may come as a real revelation which can change often radically a person's self-awareness and his whole attitude toward himself, other people, and the world. He perceives that he is a living subject endowed with the power to choose, to relate, to bring about changes in his own personality, in others, in circumstances. This enhanced awareness, this Awakening and vision of new unlimited potentialities for inner expansion and outer action gives a new feeling of confidence, security, joy, a sense of wholeness. I hope you're beginning to get excited about the act of will. I recommended it to my radio listeners also. It helps us discover who we are by becoming conscious of more of our true powers. It helps us grow toward transcendence of connecting up with that power, that ultimate mystery that flows through everything. 
When you read this book, get off by yourself someplace to do it. Don't read it where you're likely to be bothered and distracted. Roberto Assagioli, M.D., is one of the masters of modern psychology in the line that runs from Freud through Jung and Maslow. Himself a colleague of all these men, Assagioli pioneered in bringing psychoanalysis to Italy in 1910. He began simultaneously developing a critique of the Freudian contribution, pointing out that Freud had largely neglected the higher reaches of human nature, as did Maslow. Over the years, Dr. Assagioli developed a comprehensive psychology, psychosynthesis. In psychosynthesis, vision is carefully integrated with nearly all available psychological techniques into an approach which is unique for each individual. The vision of psychosynthesis sees man as naturally tending toward power and harmony within himself and with the world around him. Roberto Assagioli's new understanding of will is central to that vision and to making it real in the world. The Act of Will was first published in 1973. I particularly enjoyed his comments in Chapter 17 on the joyous will. He says the association of will with joy may seem surprising because the will has generally been considered something stern, exacting, forbidding, denying, particularly since the Victorian period. Yet the act of willing can be and often is intrinsically joyous. In order to realize this, it's necessary to have a clear conception of the nature and the various aspects and manifestations of joy. But there is not yet a coherent psychology of joy because the scientific psychology of what Maslow aptly calls the farther reaches of human nature, of being values, or even of true health, is only now in the process of emerging. The pursuit of happiness is considered and is proclaimed in the American Constitution as a right, but rarely is a clear definition given as to what happiness means. It's understood in various and divergent ways by different individuals and groups. While it's not possible on this occasion to give the psychology of joy its due, a preliminary clarification can be offered for the better understanding of the joy of willing. One can say that enjoyment is the concomitant and the result of the satisfaction of a need, of any need. Thus, for each of the levels of needs described by Maslow, there is a corresponding kind of enjoyment. The result of the satisfaction of the basic needs can be called pleasure, the general subjective state of a person whose normal needs and desires are at least temporarily satisfied can be called happiness. The result of the fulfillment of the higher needs is joy. The good will is joyous. It creates a harmonious, joyful atmosphere, and acts of good will have rich and sometimes amazing results. Altruistic humanitarian activities give deep satisfaction and a sense of fulfilling one's true purpose in life. As an Eastern sage has said, world tasks are like fires of joy. Finally, the full transpersonal self-realization and even more the communion or identification with universal transcendent reality has been called bliss. At this point, it's important to recognize that there is no fundamental incompatibility between the satisfaction of all these needs and the consequent enjoyment. Enjoyment of the higher needs does not exclude enjoyment at all other levels. So there you have definitions of enjoyment, pleasure, happiness, joy, and finally, bliss. Something you don't run across every day of the week, right? I made a speech for the IBM people in Florida the other day at their beautiful, big, and impressive headquarters in Boca Raton, and at a luncheon before the general meeting, I had a chance to chat with some of their personnel, engineering, and training people. We talked about many things, but one I remember is one of them saying, you know, we don't call ourselves teachers anymore. We use the word facilitator. I thought that was terrific. The definition of the word facilitate, according to my handy Random House Dictionary, is one, to make easier or less difficult, help forward an action, a process, and so forth, and two, to assist the progress of a person. And isn't that what we're trying to do when we teach? The late Rachel... Carson, one of the finest literary naturalists of her time, as the New York Times reported, left a fragment of work. It had been a magazine article, and she was planning to expand it, the completion of which was thwarted by her death of cancer in 1964. It's called The Sense of Wonder, and is addressed particularly to parents, but it can speak to all. There are only 96 pages in the slender book, which I took home to share with my young son the other evening, and not more than two or 3,000 words. The rest is pictures of nature and black and white and in color. Miss Carson sings her small hymn to wonder, 
using as its organizing principle the initiation into the experiences of nature of her nephew, Roger, between his infancy and age four. She did not instruct him in facts per se, but exposed him to experiences and shared them with him. It was a preparation of soil. She wrote, It is more important to pave the way for the child to want to know than to put him on a diet of facts he's not ready to assimilate. If a child asked me a question that suggested even a faint awareness of the mystery behind the arrival of a migrant sandpiper on the beach of an August morning, I would be far more pleased than by the mere fact that he knew it was a sandpiper and not a plover. Exploring nature with your child is largely a matter of becoming receptive to what lies all around you. I think what Rachel Carson was talking about was facilitating the learning process of the child, making it easy as well as interesting to learn.